Uh, so my presentation is going to be on nuclear magnetic resonance and how it's used in quantum computing. So for this presentation, I plan on giving a brief history of the topic with that mainly focusing on a few of the experiments that laid the basis for the physics needed way back when. Um, and then I'll discuss the basic concepts of quantum computing and how that relates to NMR. And then I'll give a short discussion on uh, liquid versus solid state NMR techniques for quantum computing. And then finally, uh, talk about a little bit about like future applications and advancements. <clears throat> In general, I, I made this presentation more conceptual and not really focused much on the math because most of the math of this is very out of the scope of this class. And each little thing you could talk forever about all the math every little bit. Uh, so the basic definition is of nuclear magnetic resonance is the absorption of electromagnetic radiation by a nucleus having a magnetic moment in an external magnetic field. So basically what this is saying is, um, so a nuclei will respond by producing electromagnetic single signal with a frequency that's characteristic of the magnetic field that it's being uh, exposed to. So the discovery of the concept, uh, Isaac Rabbeich is considered to have discovered the nuclear magnetic residence in the late 1930s with his research team at Columbia University. They passed a molecular beam of lithium fluoride through a coil producing an RF field and then passed also, that was also uh, surrounded by an electromagnet. Uh, the magnetic field was then slightly oscillated while the RF field was constant. Uh, with this, they saw that when the magnetic field is oscillated at the right angle, at a, at a right angle to uh, the constant RF field, the magnetic moments, and hence their nuclear spins would reorientate whenever the magnetic field frequency was near the Lamour frequency of the nuclei that they were using. And then some of the like, initial advancements. Uh, in 1945, at it's kind of, this is like really interesting because it's basically at the same time, the same year, opposite end of the country and both uh, Edward Purcell and Felix Bloch uh, both conducting experiments that advance NMR. So both of their setups were similar to rabbis, as you'll see, I'll show on the next slide. Um, Purcell's experiment was more important to the future of solid state NMR, whereas Bloch's was more important to the future of liquid state NMR. And because of the work on this topic, both of them collectively uh, received the 1952 Nobel, <clears throat> Nobel Prize in Physics. And so, as you see here on the left, you have Purcell's experiment, and on the right, you see Bloch's experiment. And as I'll show later on, Bloch's experiment, as you see here, is really similar to the setup that's used today for liquid state NMR. <clears throat> Uh, so just to wrap up a few things, so these were the first few early experiments that led the way to increase study in the NMR and its applications. So up to the point of Purcell and Bloch, no one really had any idea what this uh, like technology could be used for. But uh, over the years, with more and more research, uh, they've more and more applications for NMR have been discovered, and one of those is being in quantum computing. And then I just included a uh, a quote that I thought was really cool from Purcell's 1952 Nobel Prize speech. So the basic concept in physics, uh, to start with the basic concepts, we need to understand how NMR is utilized for quantum computing in regards to the basic rules uh, that a quantum computer needs to have uh, stated in 2000 by David DiVincenzo. So those being those are being scalable physical system that has well characterized qubits, the ability to initialize the state of a qubit to a simple fiducial state, long relevant decoherence times, much longer than the gate operation time, a universal set of quantum gates, and a qubit specific measurement capabilities. And then also six, there was like two other uh, roles, but those are much more important, like near, for like the future, because that's to do with uh, like quantum communication and all that kind of stuff. So qubits. 
<clears throat> NMR uh, quantum computers use the spin state of nuclei to act as qubits. Uh, the easiest way to accomplish this is to use nuclei that have half spin uh, when in the magnetic field, with the main choices today being hydrogen, carbon 13, nitrogen 15, fluorine 19, and phosphorus 31. Uh, when these nuclei are put into an external magnetic field, they're spin the line either parallel or anti parallel, or spin, half spin up, half spin down. Uh, in NMR systems, electromagnetic radiation can flip these spins. Uh, this being done using RF signals. And this is kind of similar as I talked about with Rabbi's experiment. Uh, so initializing the qubits. For quantum computers to function properly, the qubits need to be initialized. Uh, for conventional quantum computers, it's essentially super cooling the system down like less than like one or two Kelvin, even uh, like sometimes like as low as like 10 millikelvin. It's like a very small number. Uh, so this produces a pure ground state, which is denoted in a two-bit qubit system as zero, zero. Uh, <clears throat> so in this state, you know most of the quantum information and everything's kind of just stable, which is what you need. Uh, and then for MR quantum computing, initialization is a bit different. NMR quantum computers get initialized to pseudo pure states. And there's various different methods that, that uh, can do this, but the ones I listed here uh, each have their own problems. And so there's been a lot of research to uh, different ways to initialize them. And so uh, I read this recent study uh, and just like to keep it brief, it was using ancillary uh, helper qubits to achieve these pseudo pure states. Uh, for initialization. So they're all like really complex, but basically they use like a helper qubit that can get the qubit spins to nearly polarize the way you need them to be from the start. Uh, and then next we have decoherence. So the decoherence is decoherence time is simply the time it takes for the computer to be impacted enough by the outside environment to cause changes or errors to the state of qubits, which essentially ruins any quantum information that was collected. And then you would have to go back and uh, like reinitialize everything. And so some of the ones that are like available today that they've made, so like IBM's 20 qubit computer has around a 100 millisecond coherence time. And then D-Wave, who is another major uh, quantum computing company has had similar results. <clears throat> Oh, and also with uh, D-Waves, I watched a cool video where they show like the whole setup. And so to try to increase their coherence time, they had, uh, I think they had like 17 or 18 like layers of like protection from the outside. And so it was just uh, a really complex system just to have like a tiny bit of coherence time. Uh, and then we have NMR decoherence. So with solid NMR, the de decoherence time is around the same, if not a little bit less than traditional quantum computers. So it's around 50 milliseconds, uh, but like recently they showed promise that can show uh, coherence times of close to like half a second. Uh, and then with liquid NMR, the decoherence times can get as high as like 10 or more seconds, which is really big. And this is the reason that uh, for so long, uh, liquid NMR has been the go-to for studying NMR for quantum computing. And then here we just have a couple pictures of like the, the difference between solid NMR and liquid NMR. Um, and as I kind of talked about earlier, uh, as you see like with the liquid one, it's really similar to Rabbi's experiment uh, where you have like the vial that's liquid and then you have your nuclei in there and then you have the coil around it and then it's surrounded by a magnet. So the future of this technology is dependent on scalability. Uh, for the near future, there will obviously be used more for research due to the size, cost, and the limit limitations of the systems. Uh, and then if there's any real hope of having some sort of portable or small 
in a more quantum computer, it would need to be based on solid state technology. You can't really go around uh, transporting those liquid systems because of how big they are. And then the ability to implement the last two statements by DiVincenzo, which were uh, about like all the quantum communications. Uh, so this would allow us something such as a quantum cryptography or quantum information communication. And I thought an interesting way to think about this was like thinking of like a quantum internet. And questions. Thank you. Very interesting. Any questions for Patrick? I have one question. Um, so how much clearance time would be enough? Is 10 seconds great? Do they want a minute? Do they want just as much as possible? I mean, it's really just like as much as possible. Because even now, uh, like even with like current, like traditional quantum computers, they're, uh, like I said, their declarence time is like 100 milliseconds to like half a second, somewhere in there. And even that can get like a ton of stuff done like like is already we've already reached the point where uh quantum computers can process information faster than any like traditional computer so now it's just a point of making it as long as possible so it can do as much as possible okay yeah it makes sense because i feel like circuit designers are pretty good at working with the time constants they have yeah within a reasonable limit okay Okay. And I also know um, it's often, often if something could go longer, but if you can do it more energy efficiently by making it shorter, then it can also sometimes be better. Like if you don't need it to last minutes, yeah. maybe that's okay. 